and we're live. So welcome everyone to another episode of Awkward and Clueless. Erica is awkward because she's the Awkward Angler podcast and I'm Tom and I'm just clueless most of the time. <laughs> so um, we're here to we're here to answer your, your questions. We're here to uh, to help you out. Um, this is this is aimed at, at people that are that are you know just new at fly fishing that are that are confused by things. We want you to um, we want you to have more fun, and so we want to help you eliminate um, some of those confusing things about jargon or or things you have to do. And Eric and I have a um, a few topics lined up to talk about, but you're welcome to ask um, ask questions. Erica, what what do we want to talk about today? Um, well, uh, one of the things that I kind of got confused on when I first started is kind of where to figure out where fish are and so where to start fishing. Uh, one of the things that I've also learned is just approaching a river as well. And then, um, you know, kind of also a little bit more on reels. Um, you know, I didn't really understand what a drag was for a couple of years, so mm -hmm. just kind of stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah and right or left hand should you reel with your right or left hand we got to cover that right yeah yeah definitely absolutely yeah because <laughs> if you buy an outfit um they're going to ask you if somebody puts a line on for you whether it's uh whether it's uh, online or in a fly shop they're going to say do you want right or left hand reel and uh, <laughs> so we will uh we'll cover that for you so should we start on what do you do when you get to the water? Erica, what do you do? <laughs> well, what I used to do when I started uh, was just kind of march right into the stream and just start casting line right away. But, you know, taking some time to kind of figure out you know, what kind of bugs are, is anything hatching, right? And also noticing that fish actually like to live on the stream or on the banks, um, especially if there's bushes or rocks or something. So um, if I were to just tramp, you know, trample in the water, um, likely I'm going to spook off the fish that are, are potentially right there. So I kind of just like to look and see where a fish might be, might be living. Um, maybe it's that bank area. Um, and then just kind of reading the water of what would be a good path um, as well. Um, also looking to see if there's anyone else um, on the river, either upstream or downstream. So kind of looking at that etiquette as well. So I don't want to be fishing in someone's spot that, <laughs> you know, they might be making their way there or, or whatnot. So those are just kind of some things that I, I can, I think about. Yeah. Give other people room. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you, if you know a spot, for instance, if, if I'm thinking of a river that I fish quite a bit and it, it's quite crowded, and but I know I know the river, um, so it, it's kind of a different scenario. But when I'm going to the river, I have a plan A, plan B, a plan C, and sometimes a plan D. And those are all based really based on um, is there anybody in that spot? Mm -hmm. um, and, and if there is, I'll go somewhere else. If there's yeah. a drift boat parked there or there's somebody else waiting, you know, I'll go somewhere else, right? Um, and um, I think that that you can you can also do that um, if you don't know a river. Just you know, you, you look and there's there's two people in there. One's going up and one's going down. Well, you know, you, you don't want to draft someone on a river. You don't want to be behind them because they're they're probably going to spook the fish, and you don't want to get ahead of them. That's even worse. You know, getting in the river. If you see someone working a particular direction, whether they're working upstream or working downstream, and you get in the river right ahead of them, that's really bad stuff. That's yeah. really, really poor etiquette. So, you know, sometimes you have to walk or dr get in your car and, and drive somewhere else um, to mm -hmm. find a, another spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of a pain. Sometimes I like to go to the Taylor tailwater and there's a lot it's it's a really heavily fish spot but it's a long way to get there but you know if it's crowded i have to turn around and just find a different spot downstream mm -hmm. so kind mm -hmm. of a pain but it's also good for the fish and the area and just proper etiquette <laughs> yeah yeah and it's a nicer experience when you don't you're not in a crowd oh, yeah. right yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> and you know it it's good to have a plan when you know you get get to the river and you think oh i'm gonna fish I'm going to fish a dry dropper and I'm going to fish upstream. But, uh, you know, to paraphrase, I don't know who made the, the quote that the, the, 
the best plans don't usually survive the first battle and <laughs> the the best fishing plans uh and who where did that quote come from somebody somebody tell me where that quote came from and then you know the best fishing plans usually don't survive the first look at the water because it's dirtier than you think or it's faster than you think or it's colder than you think or there's somebody there um so you have to you have to punt and um you know you have to be flexible yeah exactly <laughs> And how do you know there's fish there in the water? That's a good question. Um, sometimes I still don't know. So I just got to try it out. <laughs> so especially if yeah. it's a new area and you're, you're new, you're beginning and you don't quite know. Um, you know, I kind of like to just fish in a pattern. And so, um, you know, starting from the inside bank where I'm standing, um, you know, cast a little bit more inside the river um, and then make my way upstream and kind of repeat. Um, but I typically look for, you know, if there's like, um, foam, like our big, um, deeper water where it's a little bit more dark and you can't see the bottom. And so that's kind of one thing that I like to look for is, um, you know, right on the side of, um, uh, you see the current moving right in the middle of the stream. Maybe there's some white water, but kind of moving more towards the edge um, and a little bit more on the bank. So kind of looking for that more mellow water that's called um, called an eddy as well. A little slower moving. Fish. Fish, pr trout, we're talking trout now. Um, trout, yeah. no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. German Helmuth von Molke. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it must have been Phil. It must have been Phil that put that up there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Phil. <laughs> Phil is the master of those, of uh, digging those things up. Um, I, see, I see a few questions here. Um, what, what should I use to replicate a fly when I'm practicing casting in the yard? A piece of yarn, usually, Tom, um, you know, uh, that, that's about the same air resistance as the fly you're going to be using. So if you're going to be fishing a bigger fly, bigger piece of yarn, um, if you're going to be actually fishing weighted streamers and you want to practice that, you might even uh, put, put a piece of yarn on the end and maybe put a little tiny split shot on there to replicate the the, um, the amount of weight on the end of there because it's a different casting motion. Um, I have a question about how to tell when the fish strikes and you're never I get tons of bites yesterday, but only two hookups. Jacob, um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty difficult for us to tell you that here without visuals, but if you go to the Orvis Learning Center and you look at the uh, the show we did with George Daniel on Euro nymphing. Um, there are some really good visuals, visual examples of what to look for for a strike when Euro nymphing. So uh, you know, I, I would advise you to go and, and take a look at that, and I think I think that'll help you actually seeing seeing that in the water. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Mike Tyson, that's a good one too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy, we got a lot of people that got that phone mokey. <laughs> I recently started just go down the river to watch it for an hour. So watch it where fish are rising and just to see what's hatching on it really helps me. Yeah, Kieran, that's a that's a wonderful idea if you can if you can stand it. <laughs> if you can <laughs> If you can sit on the bank for a half an hour, an hour, um, you'll learn a lot. And I mm -hmm. think that's great. Yeah, I, def I definitely do that from time to time. <laughs> All right. Good question. Let's see what else? I don't see any other. I don't see any other questions. Um, so, I like um, oh, sorry. So there's one, sorry. Um, should I have different reels with different types of fly line? <laughs> Should you have different reels, Erica? <laughs> you know, it took me a while to figure out what reels actually do other than keep your line. <laughs> and so uh, that's actually one area I'm looking to explore more of um, that we can talk about. It's just different reels. Um, I I haven't heard anything about, I'd be curious on what you have to say about that question, but I, yeah, I don't know, I'm still learning. <laughs> Well, if you um, if you fish in a stream in the average trout stream and you're not fishing big streamers, heavy water, you probably only need a floating line, yeah, uh, 
Roger. So you, you probably don't need a lot of different reels. Um, if you're fishing salt water or you're fishing the ocean, uh, the, sometimes there is a need for uh, a sinking line. And so there's two options. You can either get another reel and just have the extra line on, on the other reel, or you can buy an extra spool. Most reels are available where you can just buy the spool and then you can quickly change out spools. But um, and, and another way to do it where you don't have to have another reel or spool is um, if you do occasionally need a sinking tip or sinking line, let's say you're fishing a streamer and it, it's heavy, fast water and it, it's not getting deep enough for you. Um, there are these things called poly leaders and they're, I don't know, how long are they? Like eight feet long or something, eight to 10 <laughs> feet long. And it's a, it's a section of sinking line with a loop on both ends. And you loop it, loop it to the end of your floating fly line. And now you've got a sink tip line. So you don't have to buy a new fly line. You don't have to have another reel. Um, you just, you can just keep it in your pocket in, in the Ziploc bag, or you can keep it in your leader wallet. And if you need to, need to uh, get deeper, with a streamer or swing a wet fly, then you can add that. So those those poly leaders are very helpful. Yeah. What's the best way to measure water temperature with a thermometer, Ed? <laughs> I just bought <laughs> one, actually. Yeah, I'm um, not. I, I'm not being a wise ass. Uh, we use thermometers. Um, yeah. And there are. Uh, there's special stream thermometers that have a little bit more of a rugged housing that protects them. Some people will put them on a, a piece of uh, tippet material or old fly line and and dip it down in the water. I I, I just um, I just hold the thermometer in the water for thirty seconds to a minute. Is there a reliable place to get up-to-date hatch charts? I can find general ones. Yeah, the uh, Connor, it's called the internet. And um, if you if you are looking for a hatch chart in a particular area, if you if you do enough searching, you will find a hatch chart. Um, yeah, you just need to you need to look it up. Uh, there are there are books out there that that have hatch charts, but um, you know they don't they don't often they're geographically biased and you know one book might have been written more in the Catskills another book might have been written in California and so um, the best thing to do is go online you'll you'll find hats charts online yeah. learning more about line weight leader says tippet for streams and flies I basically told there is the chart, now throw it out. Any advice on matching it all up? Hmm. Um, again, I would, I, the Dan the Dan and Rose, um, I would point you toward the Orvis Learning Center and start at the very beginning and it'll, it'll you know, without us going into a complete um, fishing school here, um, you know, we're, we're, we're more set up to answer quick questions and not a, a complete treatise on <laughs> how to put it all together. But uh, the Orvis Learning Center is going to be a great resource for you. And there's other resources online and books as well. Been casting laid out straight to 50 feet. Great. Andrew went to Small Lake the first time. Had a lot of trouble casting a popper. Any tips for casting a popper? Yeah, um, poppers are more air resistant. They're they're pretty, you know, they're they're pretty air resistant and dense, and they are harder to cast. And they're not going to cast like a plain old leader. Um, open up your casting loop a little bit more. In other words, in other words, let your tip go back a little farther on the back cast and a little farther on the forward cast. That'll open up your loop, and then. Um, Probably cut back on your leader. If you're fishing a popper, you probably only need a, a three to four foot leader on the end. You're probably trying, maybe trying to cast it with a, uh, a standard trout leader, nine foot trout leader, or something. You don't need that with a popper, particularly for panfish. Um, you know, you can use a much, much shorter, stiffer leader, and I think it'll turn over better for you. How do you rate soft tackle wet flies? I've had great success with them in Southern Ontario streams. I rate them high. 
<laughs> Sounds like you do too, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> they work. <laughs> I like this one by Ray. Um, if you fish an area long enough, will you get to know what insects are hatching during a certain time of year? Some areas have insects that hatch year round and those are the patterns I start with. Okay, nice, yeah, definitely. I'm starting to get to know my local area as well and the seasonalities and, and whatnot. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I'm not very good at this, um, but if you keep a diary, or, mm -hmm. or keep a chart or a diary or keep notes um, that'll help you a lot and you know describe you don't need to know the latin name of the bug um <laughs> you know just just say i saw a cream colored size 12 fly that ha was hatching in the morning about 10 o'clock mm -hmm. and the water temperature was x um that'll be pretty valuable as the years go by and you you don't need to know what bug it is who cares <laughs> um, you'll know that next year, about that same time of year, unless the weather pattern is much, much different, you'll see the same bug on this on the same date range because they do have a progression, just like wildflowers and plants and things. Um, the the mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies and midges, um, they have a progression uh, through the season when different species emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, pros and cons of a furrowed leader. I don't know of any pros for a furrowed leader. I think Pharaoh, I think by Pharaoh, you mean furrowed leader. Um, they cast okay. They're fine. Um, I, I, I don't care for them. You ever use furrowed leaders, Erica? I don't think so. No. I don't, I don't know a single guide that uses furrowed leaders ever. And I've asked every guide I've ever known or fished with if they use furrowed leaders. And, and none of them do. So that, that may tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> but if you like them, use them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> do you ever use a swivel between leader and tippet? Do I get line twists on larger flies? Yes, Christopher. There's a thing called a micro swivel. You can actually find them on the Orvis website. And um, if you're using uh, uh, bigger bass bugs, or articulated streamers, these micro swivels are great. You can you can tie it at the uh, the end of your leader, and then tie your tippet on there, tie your fly on, and that'll stay permanently on the end of your leader. And all you have to do is keep tying new pieces of tippet on the end when they get too short. And that that little tiny micro swivel will keep your leader from twisting. So yeah, those are great. Those little 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 tiny micro swivels. <laughs> What difference yeah. from fast action and slow action? Erica, you want to handle this one? Yeah, um, I actually sent all of my, um, I, I had some rod repairs recently. And so the only rod I had was a slow action rod and it was super bendy. <laughs> so mm -hmm. super, um, you know, when I kind of cast in the air, it was super wiggly. And, you know, I, I really kind of, was a little frustrated with it when I was nymphing, but I found uh, pretty fun. I thought it was really fun with a dry fly. Um, but, you know, it was just kind of something I was more comfortable with. Um, and so I really like the fast action, which is a little bit more stiff. Um, and I feel like I, I feel personally like I have more accuracy with a stiffer rod. And so um, just kind of feeling it out and really just kind of spending a lot of time with that slow action rod, figuring out what I liked, what I didn't like, um, mm -hmm. you know, really hard for streamer fishing as well <laughs> on a slow action rod. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I, I went back to fast action, um, but, you know, there's small creeks and whatnot that I like to kind of bust out the slow, um, which is really more flexible um, is what I found. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really, Kieran, it, it's almost a matter of, of your personality and your personal taste. They'll, they'll both do the same thing. Um, slow action rod is going to, um, your casting tempo is going to be a little bit more relaxed. The fish are going to bend the rod more when you play them. Um, on the other hand, a fast, faster action rod is going to help you cast in the wind. It's going to help you cast farther. It's going to help you cast bigger flies. 
Um, slow action rods roll cast better. So if you're mm -hmm. in a lot of tight spots um, and you can't make an overhead cast, um, slow action rods are much better at roll casting. But it's almost a matter of, like Erica said, I like fast action rods, mm -hmm. right? Personally, I like slower action rods. Um, yeah, um, I like the feel of them, um, <laughs> but but you know if if I go if I'm going salt water fishing and I need to cast sixty feet um, in the wind, I'm going to have a fast action rod. Mm, yeah, but for trout, yeah, I, I like a slower. I like a slower one. <laughs> All right, we were going to talk about reels. Let's talk about reels. Yeah, let's get real, Tom. <laughs> yeah, let's get real. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you when you get an outfit, somebody will ask you, "You real? Are you you real right or left? Or do you want right hand retrieve or left hand retrieve?" Which is is very confusing. And let me get this right up front: it doesn't matter whether you're right or left handed. When they say right or left hand retrieve, it's the hand you crank with, okay? It's when you pick up a rod, which hand do you crank with? Do you crank with your right or do you crank with your left? That's right and left hand retrieve. It has nothing to do with right handedness or left handedness. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I'm going to tell you that it doesn't matter one damn bit. Just pick a lane, All right? Do you real? Yeah. Are you right handed? I'm right-handed, yeah. And do you reel? Do you reel with your left hand? I reel with my left. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And that <laughs> makes sense because you're casting, and then you you reel in, you reel in. It makes yep. sense. Yep. I'm very strongly right-handed. Mm -hmm. I cast right-handed, and I reel left-handed. I switch hands when I reel, and people say, "Oh God, you got to switch hands." Well, is that hard to do? <laughs> You know, it's like, it's not that hard. It's my chance. Um, reason I, the reason I like right hand retrieve, uh, one is I'm very strongly right handed. So if I have to really, really do this, um, it's easier with my right hand. Plus I'm casting with my right all day long. If I play a fish, I give this hand a rest and I use this hand. Mm -hmm. Also, when I'm stripping line, I don't have a handle to get in the way of the line. It's on the other side, it's on the far side. Um, but it doesn't matter, it really doesn't matter. You reel whichever way you are most comfortable, pick up a fly rod and say, okay, which hand, which which makes more sense to me? And usually if you're right-handed, it's, it's gonna be left, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And um, just pick one. Yeah, agreed. Now, the one thing you have to know is that um, you have to change a couple things. If you switch a reel from right to left hand, wind, you have to change the drag system over. And you also have to take all the line in the backing off and reel it back on because it's going to go. It goes on the wrong way. If you if, you, if I start to reel, if I start to reel this uh, this way, it's going to it's going to go backwards and all the lines going to get all bunged up. Um, and we should talk about drag. So drag is, there's two tensions on a reel. There's the tension when you reel in, which always should be very light. Okay. To make it easy to reel. And then in the opposite direction, there is a break on that spool. And it's harder to pull that line off. And there's a there's a, a number of reasons for this. Um, one is that you want some resistance on that line out direction. When you're stripping line off to make a cast, if your drag is set too light, the spool will overrun. You'll do this and the spool will keep going and um, it'll get all tangled up. So you want some tension on there. And also this acts as a, this drag acts as a mechanical break. Um, it will help tire a fish out because it's harder for the fish to pull that and it's gonna tire the fish out when it runs. Now, 90% of the time we're trout fishing, we don't need to worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
what what I do with all my trout reels is I you the drags are adjustable. There's usually a knob. It depends on what reel you have that goes from really super light. Uh, if I if I back this drag off all the way and yank on it, see how it overran? Okay, that's too light, right? The drag's too light because when I strip line, now I got a big tangle. <laughs> oh, what a mess, right? <laughs> so, oh my God, it, see, it went all the way down into the belly of that line and that green stuff. So I have to tighten. I'm going to reel this back on. I have to tighten that drag enough by turning this knob, and it's going to vary with the reel. The, so, so, and you want it so you can pull it off easily, but it's not going to overrun. So that's still a little bit light. So I'm going to make it a little bit tighter, and now, now it doesn't overrun. So I'm not going to get that. And you know what? That's probably the drag I'm going to use for fishing. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to to really worry about. Um, drag with with trout and bass fishing you do in um, steelhead and salmon and saltwater fishing where a fish might run might right one might run anywhere from 20 yards to 100 yards to even more and you're going to want to try to tire that fish out and so as the fish runs you might gently tighten up on that drag don't make big drag adjustments when a fish is running because you can tighten it down too much in the the Tip it will snap. But, you know, if you're if you're fishing for bigger fish, then you want to tighten up on your drag. But for most for most trout fishing, you want it nice and light. You're using light tippets. You don't want to put a lot of tension on that fish running. Um, and um, so you, if, if you have a, a reel that's, say, right hand and you want you want to switch it to left hand, you're going to have to take all the line off. Um, take it out in the yard so you can walk around with it. Don't strip it off on the floor. <laughs> uh, where you, where your dog or your cat can get into it and make a big tangle, but take it outside and you know walk around the yard a few times, um, and and then uh, you know lay it on the uh, lay it on the ground and then reel it back in the right way. But you are going to have to switch your drag over, and uh, that can be incredibly easy, or it can be on some reels can be incredibly complex. And when you bought a reel, you probably got an instruction booklet with it that tells you how to switch the drag over from right hand to left hand. If not, uh, take it to a fly shop or call the manufacturer. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And they'll be able to give you instructions on switching that drag over. Yep. But you only have to do it once in your life, right? You, um, you know, you only have to do it once. And it's yep. not like you're going to be switching back and forth yeah. <laughs> all the time. All right. So I hope we I hope we cleared up the right and left hand stuff and drag. Mm -hmm. Also, your strong hand is now your net hand. Oh, Andrew, good point. I never thought of that. <laughs> oh, another reason. Oh, great, great point. Great point. Now you're making me think that I'm going to switch a little bit. A reel or two over just to try it out. <laughs> oh no, don't do that. You confuse yourself. <laughs> when I borrow a reel from Sean Combs, he reels left hand. When I borrow a reel from him, I'm always going, ah. Oh. <laughs> it, it drives me nuts. <laughs> um do you agree that a reel on a three-weight rod is only a line holder? Manny, it is if you're only catching small fish. Um, yeah, if you're awesome. If you're if you're fishing at three weight and you might get into a twenty inch uh, brown trout, you're going to want a nice drag, nice smooth drag on that reel mm -hmm. when the fish runs. So, yeah, it's basically a line holder. But um, and you know, really, people, the the choice of the reel that you make is is very very personal. Um, it's much it's much it's much less pragmatic than picking a fly rod. Picking a fly rod, fly rod is a tool. A reel, a reel is a tool, but it's also, you know, it's also bling. It's a, it's also a, a jewel. And you know, uh, this is a this is a Mirage LT. It, it's made in it's made in New Hampshire. Um, I actually know the owner of the factory, 
and I've been to the factory and watched them made. And, you know, I really, and I've seen the pride that the people take in making this reel. Um, you know, it's really special. It's really special. So pick a reel that looks good to you. You know, pick the, <laughs> the color you like. Um, pick the way it sounds, you know, do reels sound differently. Pick the way it sounds. But um, it, it's so much more of a, of a personal choice. And reels can be as inexpensive or expensive as you want to make them, depending on what you want. Yeah. I like that you said they're like a uh, bling. <laughs> because it now, is. That, no, well, now that I'm starting to know more about it, I've always just kind of had what the kits offered, which is still fine. It still works. And uh, But now that I'm starting to really understand the, the types of different fishing and the drags and the, the look, essentially, is how can I make mm -hmm. my rod look better? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's important, right? Yeah, but then again, just starting, right, and just kind of getting basic. I have I have a bunch of or, um, encounter reels that work mm -hmm. just great. Um, you know, they do the job, they do the trick, and and whatnot. So, but um, after fishing for a few years, now now I'm starting to see that light, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> they sound nicer. They feel, you know, they're machined really nicely. I mean, it's a it's a work of art. It's really a, a beautiful piece of machinery. Okay. Um, you know the encounter. The encounter is a great reel. It's not made in USA. It, it does the job. It does the job perfectly well. I could fish the rest of my life with an encounter reel and and probably never lose a fish because I had an encounter instead of a Mirage LT. But I like my Mirage LTs. Yep. Yep. <laughs> cool. And Ray makes a good point. Uh, exposed rim most of the reels that you buy today have an exposed rim and if you need a little bit of extra drag if you need to slow fish down you can do what's palming the reel which is kind of just gently bringing your palm up against the bottom of that reel and and adding a little friction to that and that will that will help slow a fish down you know if a fish is maybe a fish is uh, headed for a log jam and you need to quickly slow it down and yeah, you may break your tippet, uh, but you, you you know if the fish gets in a log jam, it's for sure going to break your tippet. So you can slow it down by quickly bringing your palm up underneath it and palming that reel, putting some extra pressure on it. So just keep your hands away from that that handle when it's spinning because you can get your knuckles wrapped for fishes <laughs> running fast. <laughs> All right. Oh, I love that. Your strong hand is now your net hand. <laughs> I got to remember that one. Okay. Um, let's see. We're going to talk about fish handling too, Erica. Why don't we talk about safe? Why don't you talk about safe fish handling and hook removal? Most sure. people, I assume, are, are probably going to release most of their fish, so it's important to you. So, Erica, why don't you talk about good sure. techniques there? Yeah, you know, I like to, um, I kind of started out without a net and then I realized I was probably doing a little bit more harm to the fish than good, <laughs> trying to get the hook out. So um, get, a, get a net, um, that's one thing that can be really helpful. Um, and then I like to, you know, obviously keep the fish wet as much as possible and eliminating the, the time out of the water for the fish. Um, and then, um, you know, wetting your hands is also really important. Fish kind of have this coating um, that helps them, that protects them. And so, um, you know, our hands um, just kind of getting moist and, and wet um, before we handle the fish is really helpful for them. Um, and then just kind of lightly, you know, you can grab it or um, um, kind of, I like to say not too hard or not too, not too, um, not too soft so it can flop out of your hands. So a nice good grip, but not too hard because um, their organs are really, really sensitive. Um, and then kind of stay away from their gills, um, you know, on the, on the side of their face is going to be also uh, really important. And then, um, you know, just kind of trying to find the hook. Um, I use a pair of hemostats to kind of help get that hook out of the, out of the mouth as well. Um, and then quickly releasing as much as possible or as quickly as possible. Um, you know, if you want to take a photo really quickly, you know, try to keep near the water. Um, but eliminating that time um, out of the water is going to be really helpful. Um, one of the things I kind of like to do is in solidarity with the fish is also hold my breath <laughs> if I have to pick it up out of the water as well. So um, that's just kind of my 
a little bit of more of an overview of my my technique. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, the, the studies that they've done show that the biggest cause of fish mortality, uh, because a lot of times people say, oh, it swam away fine, but uh, the, the, actually the highest stress comes 5, 10, 15 minutes after you release the fish. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can kill a fish and not know it, but the, the, the biggest stressor uh, on fish is handling time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want that picture, if you got to have that picture for Instagram, you got to either get your friend ready with their phone or their camera, or you got to reach in your pocket while you're playing the fish, get that phone handy and ready. And um, if you're going to have to lift the fish out of the water, you want to lift it out for no more than 10 seconds. Yep. So um, that fish should still be dripping when you put it back in the water. 10 seconds is a long time. 10 seconds is plenty of time to take five pictures. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, the less time you spend handling that fish, mm -hmm. uh, the easier it's going to be to release that fish unharmed. Yeah. And also, you know, some folks like to protect their hands from the sun and wear gloves, but um, definitely take off the gloves as well. Um, I don't, I would strongly advise never touching or grabbing a fish with gloves or any other type of material other than your wet hands. Yeah. And if you stick your fingers in a fish's gills, you probably killed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it may swim away, but you probably killed it. In fact, in fact, a lot of times if you hook a, if you hook a fish really deeply and it gets in the gills, and the fish starts to bleed, that fish is probably going to die. And there's, you know, if it's not catch and release, you might as well take that fish home and eat it. If it's mm -hmm. catch and release, then you're going to have to try to release it. And it'll probably feed some mink or raccoons or otters or eagles or ospreys. But, um, you know, if, if you get anywhere near those gills, they're so delicate that the fish is probably going to die. So. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you mentioned it, but it's not immediately that we're going to see the fish die. It's really tragic to kind of walk up to a bank um, and see a dead fish, you know, on the side of the stream. And, you know, I always kind of go back to um, that was probably poor fish handling of, of why that fish is still there. And um, likely it did swim away. But the person that, you know, had caught it before um, won't know that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, we do have impacts of um, later on that we don't recognize in the moment. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing, when you release a fish, um, you see people shoving them back and forth in mm -hmm. the water to resuscitate them. Don't do that because uh, fish aren't made to have water go through their gills backwards and it's not good for them. What you want to do is take the fish and hold it into a nice, clear, moderate current. You don't want it to be in totally dead frog water and you don't want it to be in really fast current. So just get into some shallow, clear, moderate current. Hold the fish there until it takes off under its own power. And when they're ready to go, um, you can't hold on to them. They'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you have to revive a fish, let's say you have a fish that's kind of turning over sideways and it's just not righting itself and you, you let it go and it kind of tips over sideways, um, you have to try to revive it a little bit more, but there, there's two reasons that happens. One is that you played the fish for too long. Don't don't play fish any longer and you have to get them in as quickly as possible. And the other reason is that the water's too warm. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you wanna stop fishing when the water temperature hits 68, 69, 70 degrees for trout, um, mm -hmm. because they can survive in water up to 75, sometimes 80 degrees. Um, but not when you stress them by uh, jerking them around on the end of your line. That's that's going to put an added load onto their uh, oxygen demand because their respiratory system is is working much harder. It's like, you know, us on a treadmill yeah. and they can't get enough oxygen in that warmer water and they will suffocate. They'll die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if the water is the water's 68 first thing in the morning, you better go. Um, bass fishing or bluegill fishing or carp fishing or something else because um, the water is going to be too warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Which I'm excited to use my thermometer. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'll learn a lot by using that thermometer. 
Yeah, Scott, uh, out west this summer with your heat wave and drought, you're going to have to be really careful. We just we just came off a big heat wave in the east that's starting to cool down now, but, but we had – I was out this morning on a stream. It was not a it was not a, a, a great stream. It was kind of a lowland stream, but it was sixty eight degrees first thing in the morning. So I, I quit fishing. Mm-hmm. How do you know when it's time to replace your fly line? Oh, that's a good one, um, TJ. Uh, if you start seeing cracks in the line, just little, little cracks in the line, little circular cracks then it's time to replace it. Um, that's usually the sign. And um, and if it's a floating line, it'll start to sink and it won't, you won't be able to keep it floating because the water gets in through the coating into the core. So if it starts to look cracked, then it's time to replace it. But fly lines, you know, a, a modern fly line, if you take good care of it, you know, should last you four or five, six years. Um, depends on how much you fish and, and how much you strip it on gravel and step on it and all that, you know, just like anything else. But, um, I was just saltwater fishing with a fly line that I had saved because it was an old fly line taper that I really liked. It's probably 15, 20 years old and it worked, it worked just great, but I hadn't, I hadn't used it a lot. I had stored it, you know, in my basement, but, um, you know, the, the fly lines will last a pretty good time. Pretty good amount of time as long as you take good care of them. Mm-hmm. Don't get insect repellent on them. Yeah. That'll hurt them. Mm-hmm. I have a small tripod with phone set up on the bank as a remote control for photos. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And Karen oh, okay. says, just remember not to leave it behind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. Yep. <laughs> All right. Do we have any any other questions? Did we did we did we talk about? Uh, we talked about the things we had on the on our agenda today, Erica. Yeah. Um, oh, here's a good one for you. <laughs> from from Adam. Here, I'll put it up on the. Oh great. Um, any pointers for welcoming new fly fishers into the community? What have you seen work well or not? Um, I really like um, just connecting with different fly shops that have been really supportive and really awesome. And, you know, just kind of being welcoming, answering my questions. Um, Also attending different fly fishing clinics or different fly fishing events and just kind of making them um, warm and welcoming, which to me looks like, um, you know, kind of a, a mixed group of folks. <laughs> I was kind of like looking at diversity of folks that are also there. It can be pretty intimidating um, starting off, um, you know, and kind of also just um, having the attitude that just not catching fish is the goal. I mean, I know that is the goal, but um, <laughs> what we're talking about is uh, when you're new to fly fishing, understanding that you're going to get caught in trees, <laughs> you might fall in the river. Um, and even after years of still doing that. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of that's part of fishing um, and having, you know, making it fun. I notice sometimes when I look at other anglers on the water, um, they're so in the zone that they're really serious. And I, I can get that way as well. But um, if you're really new, just kind of making it more fun. And um, yeah, just kind of um, more realistic, I would say, more realistic expectations and putting out mm. front um, mm-hmm. of what to expect has been really helpful for me. Um, I also learned from a person that was, this is how you do fishing everywhere you go. <laughs> and that's obviously not the case. So, you know, I was using 6X, 6X Tippet for a lot of different areas that would also break off. So, Anyway, just kind of more uh, realistic expectations that were set for me um, have been really helpful in in getting into fishing. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of just a, a quick overview of what's what's helped me. Um, uh, also, social media as well, getting plugged into different groups and whatnot, and um, connecting with different folks online has been really helpful. <laughs> Be very careful of social media, though, because because all you're yeah. going to see is big fish and you're going to feel insecure. You know, you go on social media and you see all these people with these giant brown trout and you go out and you catch, you know, a stock fish this long and, and you feel bad. You feel insecure. <laughs> so don't, you know, take a lot of that with a big grain of salt and, and yep. 
Yeah. You need to sometimes ignore social media because people are, <laughs> you know, people are only going to show the, the giant fish that they caught once a year on social media. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's why I kind of like keeping my account more realistic and finding other folks that, <laughs> um, you know, enjoy the little fish uh, as well as the big fish and a variety mm -hmm. of species as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's absolutely right, Tom. That can definitely be deceiving for sure. <laughs> What have you been doing on your podcast lately? What kind of topics have you had? Oh, yeah. So my podcast is, you know, um, an authentic series talking about um, social justice, fly fishing and storytelling with folks in the outdoor industry. So I'm actually on season two right now. So I just had um, Jackie Kutzer and Christy Atkins that work for Orbis and talking about their 50-50 on the water initiative um, and kind of looking beyond more bringing more folks of different genders, um, you know, such as transgendered or non-binary folks on board um, and their learnings and whatnot. Um, uh, my, some of the other things are just different learnings from other women that are fly fishing, such as um, Heather Hudson, the founder of United Women on the Fly, um, you know, and kind of just more or less their own personal stories and their journeys and getting into fishing and what a good day on the water looks like for them. And Mostly just kind of different learnings that they've come across within the fly fishing space. So. And it's called the awkward angler, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget. It. Yeah. What fly pattern would you consider to be universal? My home water is Little Red River, and I find that fly patterns used here do not tend to work on other trout streams, more specifically the streams located in Blue Ridge Mountains. Um. Well, Rick, there are some that are universal. I mean, the, the black woolly bugger, um, I'm sure it works on the little red. Uh, zebra midge, parachute atoms, <laughs> um, you know, trout or trout. And uh, their food supply is going to be different. So, the you know, the fly that's effective on one on one stream might not be effective everywhere. But, um, you know, m nearly all of them eat eat crayfish when they get bigger, they eat minnows, they eat, they eat midges, they eat mayflies, they eat caddisflies. So um, there's, a, there's a lot more flies that transcend geographic regions than there are flies that are only, will only work in a certain area, so. Mm -hmm. yep. I fish man of the Sierras and it's not about the fish, it's about the tug that is the drug. Uh, <laughs> Yep. Beautiful. <laughs> Kieran says, take a toy action figure with you, put fish <laughs> beside it, fish will look massive. Ah, good idea. <laughs> I don't know if I like that one as well as using my stronger hand to net the fish, Kieran, but um, I I'll try it sometime. <laughs> what do you recommend for selecting a net? Ah, uh, good point. I think that's actually my dad asking that question. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Hey, dad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you going to answer your dad or do I have to? I'll have you answer it. <laughs> <laughs> he won't take advice from you, right? <laughs> no, he, he does for sure. <laughs> so, John, um, you know, you 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 want to you want to pick a net that that's suitable to the size of fish you're catching, right? That's that's pretty obvious. You want you want them to go in there without having to bend them in half. Um, uh, the the only thing I really recommend is that you get a, a a net with a rubber bag, a soft rubber bag, because it's much easier on the fish. The old nylon polypropylene strings um, can are really abrasive and they can hurt a fish and. Um, also, if you fish multiple flies, the old corded um, nets, if you get you get your second fly stuck in there, you can never get it out. Whereas a rubber net, the fly just pops right out of the rubber. So so just get a rubber net bag of a style that appeals to you. It's, it's kind of like a reel, you know, nets come in, come in everything from just plain old aluminum or carbon fiber to beautiful woods and, you know, pick but but get one with a rubber net bag. That's I think that's the only consideration. <laughs> How bad is on the fish if you have break off and the fly is stuck in the fish? Ah, excellent question, Al. And I'm going to answer this one because I 
I recently uh, discussed this with a friend of mine who's a marine biologist, Aaron Adams from Bonefish Tarpon Trust. And, and um, we're talking about when you when you hook a fish deeply and you can't get the fly out and you don't want to stick your forceps way down their throat, um, just cut it off. Um, or if you break a fish off, that they're going to get rid of that hook sometimes within a manner of matter of minutes, Al. Um, they, um, and if, if it doesn't come right out, uh, it'll, it'll, uh, the flesh will fester a little bit and soften and the hook will come out, particularly if you're using barbless hooks. So um, I, I wouldn't worry about it. If you break a fish off, the, the fly is going to, going to come out of that fish fairly quickly. Uh, Adam, that rod's perfect for steelhead and bass. Yeah, I use a nine weight sometimes on the Salmon River. Um, you know, a lot of people like two-handed rods, but a, but a nine weight's it's not too heavy, particularly if you might get into some um, Pacific salmon. And I don't think it's too heavy for bass, particularly large ones. I think a nine weight is 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 just about right. So I you know I'd use it. I, I don't think I'll have any trouble. And um, and believe me, even a ten inch bass will still bend a nine weight uh, pretty good. It'll still give you a good fight. So, uh, you know, it's not too heavy. <laughs> ah, yeah. You want to talk about, you want to answer this one, Erica? Sure. Yeah. I would say, um, I think when I first started fishing, the easiest thing for me to comprehend was to strip in. <laughs> Uh, just because that was the easiest thing that you know, to wrap my head around how to reel this in and, and keep you know fighting the fish and whatnot. So um, just really helpful for beginners is just to start stripping in. But um, you know, as I started to progress and start using my reel, I always try to get it on the reel. Um, but sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes the fish will come right towards me and I don't have time <laughs> to to put it on my reel. So I'll just strip in. So it just kind of depends on the situation. But I typically these days try to always get it on the reel. Yeah, I mean, um, my my view is a little bit different. Um, I, I'll strip them in unless the fish tells me that I'm not going to strip it in. In other words, I start stripping in the fish, and all of a sudden the fish takes off. It's a bigger fish, and it runs, and I just clear the line and let it go. But if the mm -hmm. fish doesn't pull any line, then I'll, I'll strip it in all the way. Um, that does create a problem sometimes if you, you strip in a whole bunch of line around your feet and then you're trying to land the fish and it jumps through the hoops. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you're probably smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have sea run browns in the States? If so, how come I never see videos or hear about it? Christopher, we have very few. We have, uh, we have uh, a few streams in um, the state of Maine and, uh, a uh, few streams in Massachusetts uh, where we have sea run browns, but it's a very, very, very limited. So we don't, we don't have a lot of sea run browns. Of course, on our West coast, we have steel sea run rainbows, which are steelhead, mm -hmm. but um, no, we don't have a lot of sea run browns at all in the States. All right, Erica. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go fishing this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm keeping you from your fishing and it's, we've almost <laughs> gone an hour. Um, and I don't see, I don't see any new questions. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Those are some great questions, some great suggestions. Um, very helpful suggestions and, and very perceptive questions. And, and again, um, you know, we're, we're going to do this once a month. Um, ask any question you want. No question is too basic. Uh, mm -hmm. No question is too simple. No question is too basic. Uh, we, we want to want to help you on your journey and we want to, uh, we want to answer those questions that you can't find uh, the answer to anywhere else. Great. Except don't ask me my favorite fly. <laughs> I hate that question. Because I don't have one. <laughs> Do you have a favorite fly? 
Uh, I guess it just depends. I, I I really like big, big, big bugs, big chubby <laughs> Chanel rolls. So that's, I think I'm going to try that this afternoon. <laughs> okay. All right. You're exploring a new river, so I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will see you in about a month. I don't know the exact date, but um, we'll, we'll post it. Uh, we'll post it on our social media and, um, Get those questions, write down a list of questions and come on in and ask them. We'll help you the best as best we can. Yep. August 5th. August 5th. Okay. <laughs> August 5th. All right. All right, everyone. Have a great 4th of July weekend. Hope you get out there and enjoy the outdoors and stay cool. <laughs>